Mm. So, hi everybody. Hope you can uh, see and hear me. Do let me know. I will uh, keep an eye out for the chat for when we are something like live. So, hi everybody. Hope you can uh, see and hear me. Do let me know. I will uh, keep an eye out for the chat for when we are something like live. So, let's turn so that. hi everybody. Hope you can. Uh, So I hope, I hope for, sorry that you got me back here just there. Um, that was because obviously I was on YouTube and I came through on YouTube. So hopefully um, that echo has now gone and uh, you'll be able to, uh, I'll just give it another sort of 10, 15 seconds to allow your chat to go through. Um, but hopefully that has isolated the echo uh, issue. So just give me a, a thumbs up. So I come on early when I'm at home just to, uh, just to make sure that um, We've kind of got the sound right and this, that and the other. So uh, the echo's gone. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic. So, um, yeah, uh, sound. So now can we now talk about volume levels? Um, is that OK on the microphone? Uh, go and gong, gong. Fantastic, Tish. We'd like to hear that. So do let me know if my voice is coming through to you at about the right kind of volume. Uh, all clear. Hello, Julie. Hello, Dawn. Janie's with us. I'll make from York, uh, Natalie from the Netherlands, and Tish and Lethargy is here as well, and lovely Leslie, and Susan O, and uh, Reverend Dot's with us as well. So Reverend Dot, right up your street, I hope today. So Reverend Dot, I'm sure, is going to be on hand to correct me uh, if I slip up, because obviously um, we're going to be talking about uh, both the Cistercian Order, but also about Easter. So I just kind of give you a little heads up, obviously, for those that aren't aware. Um, I did this tour on Easter Sunday, um, but in the, once I got into the midst of the ruins uh, of Jervo, the usual thing kind of kicked in, in terms of, um, Julie, I'm not even going to get into your embarrassing winging situation, but let's hope it's all sorted. All I can say is that there are products available. Um, but the, 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 the 4G was intermittent, so consequently, um, what I thought was, okay, let's, rather than it just being buffering and doing everyone's head in, let's, let's kind of close it out, and then I will go back, did some filming, so I did some HD film, which you're going to see in, in a little bit, in sort of second half of this, and I also did some, some 360, which I'm going to launch soon on YouTube. So, um, you all here, fantastic, Marilyn, and um, so... Uh, that's what we're going to do today. So, in effect, we're going to stitch together. The sort of first half uh, will be um, what we did live in the Dales, okay, as like a video. And then it'll be the video that I shot, and I'll be talking live narration over that. So, as Reverend Dot is here, um, hopefully she will forgive me for doing an Easter tour when it is not Easter, but I'm sure she'll be the first to acknowledge that it could have been Easter because obviously the way the span that Easter can fall into, we are certainly still within Easter territory. So if it was another year, it could quite easily be um, that Easter Sunday was tomorrow rather than last week. So I do hope you'll forgive me. I've got all this material ready for last week. And I kind of like it. Um, so I hope you will too, uh, in terms of traditions, not only in terms of the, the monastic and the, 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 the faith-based traditions, but also the secular things, also how, how they kind of come together uh, and sort of link. So, um, are we about, I think probably we are about at eight o'clock, aren't we? So good evening, one and all. Welcome to this at-home presentation um, where we are going to uh, have a look at uh, some footage that was captured last week on Easter Sunday um, up at Jervo Abbey in, in Wensleydale in the Yorkshire, the fabulous Yorkshire Dales. And uh, the first part is kind of pre-recorded. So I'll be around on the chat if you want me, um, but then I'll kind of go into live narration after about 25 minutes in, uh, I believe. So hopefully um, for anybody who didn't kind of capture it, you can get the whole thing. Um, for those that, that were part of it, hopefully you enjoy it and, and worth watching. But if you kind of really don't want to, then drop out now for 20 minutes and come back in and you'll see stuff that you haven't kind of seen before. So Susan's still eating the last hot cross buns. Bear that in mind. When the season is Easter tide dot. Yeah, absolutely right. And of course, in the medieval era, when we're talking about monastic traditions, um, Christmas tide, Easter tide, Whitsuntide, these things were lengthy lenticles, lengthy festivals. So we tend to think now things are bank holidays, kind of one day here and there, but that's not really the history of kind of Christianity and faith, isn't really about abiding by traditions on one day. It was about a series of days, even weeks, sometimes even months. So, um, 
It probably is, uh, yeah, um, Dawn, I, I can't go any, I forget what I could go wider, I suppose, but all you get is more, more, you know, more of me. And to be honest, you can have too much truth, you know. Um, at my age, sometimes a bit of distance from the camera um, is not necessarily a bad thing. But when the video comes in, I believe you'll be fully immersed in the, uh, in the 360. So, so just a bit heads up then, so we're about to go to Jervo. So Jervo is in Wensleydale. Um, so we're on the kind of, the, what would be the northeastern edge of the Yorkshire Dales National Park. And uh, it's a space that is very much kind of um, populated by the Cistercian Monastery. It's got fountains, Revo, Jervo, Byland. So this is a place where, if you're very interested in this kind of um, experience, you're going to say, then, then this is a part of North Yorkshire you definitely want to check out. So without further ado, I'm going to switch through. Um, and can you just keep the chat going? Uh, for a minute or two, just let me know on the volume. So obviously I'm going to move from me talking to a pre-recorded video. So again, just help me out here and make sure that the volume levels are correct. So give me some feedback, um, but otherwise sit back and enjoy. And hopefully, and again, obviously let, let me know on echo if you can still hear me or whatever, but hopefully it will all go swimmingly well. So if you're sitting comfortably, we will begin. Let us say welcome, one and all. Greetings, happy Easter, and of course, welcome to Yorkshire. Welcome to Wensleydale. Wensleydale. I'll just give you a little kind of pan out to allow you to get a sense of of place of kind of where where we are. We might have a couple of acts, but let's uh, let's go and say hello to uh, to Wallace and Gromit. We can't come to Wensleydale without bringing them with us. And they are relaxed because they are sitting, looking at what I think is a very beautiful spot indeed, which is the uh, the Riviera. So welcome to Wednesday for this special Easter Sunday tour. Um, we're going to be visiting the ruins of the spectacular Jervo, one of the great Cistercian abbeys of Yorkshire in England. Um, now, the earliest record of this place named Jervo dates from 1145, where it appears as Jerval. The name is French for the Ewer Valley, and it's perhaps a translation of the English Ewerdale, perhaps also known now as Yordale. And this valley, of course, is now known as Wensleydale. So we're here at Harker Beckmouth on the River Ewer, and the river we're looking at will wind its way through Wensleydale before joining the River Ouse and flowing on into York in that direction in front of us. Um, but it's further up the or kind of in this direction um, that the story of Jervo Abbey actually begins. The story of the kind of foundation of the Abbey is told at great length in the register of Byland Abbey. Um, the writer records that a certain knight by the name of Acarius Fitz Bardolf, what a wonderful name that is, gave to a monk in, of Sauvigny in Normandy by the name of Peter de Quinceo um, and other monks parts of his lands at Floors in Wensleydale where they might found an abbey. So how these monks sort of came to be in these parts is not actually kind of explained, but it seems they were sojourning at the court of Alan, Earl of Richmond. And the Earl was a nephew and heir to Alan Rufus, who was the kind of Norman overlord of kind of North Yorkshire, and who'd been gifted much of the county by William the Conqueror as a reward for his support at the Battle of Hastings. I've actually got a picture of, uh, of Rufus. Let me just find that for you. Um, kind of receiving all his prizes and uh, is that, it? Let me do that. Oh, it's always in the way where we do it? it's always in the wrong place yeah so there he is with William the Conqueror receiving all the gifts and the lands so his nephew was the man who kind of granted the lands to kind of make this happen um, in the first instance so that's Alan Rufus a very very important Norman who came across and as so often we talk about these stories, it is the Battle of Hastings, the Norman Conquest, that sort of creates this land, this world. So the Earl instructed the monk Peter to let him know when the first buildings were built, um, so he could be present. Um, and when it was ready, Peter um, informed the Earl, who came down with four or five of his knights to the place where the first building was to be raised by the waterside. And um, it's said that the Earl said, we all have great lands and possessions. 
Now therefore, let us help with our own hands and build this house in the name of our Lord and let each and, each and every one of us give land or revenue in perpetual arms for the maintenance of part which each shall have raised. Now it said that some kind of readily assented, but others only reluctantly, sensing actually that uh, despite what Wallace and Gromit might think, much of Wensleydale is not a good place to be farming. The location actually was very, very poor. Um, but this was where the first house was built in 1145, and uh, it'd be in this kind of general direction over here, but about 15 miles down the river from where we are right now. So soon after this, Earl Allen, uh, so I'll just pack up Wallace and Gromit, we'll get on our way. Earl Allen visiting um, Sauvigny in Normandy, informed the abbot that Brother Peter and the other monks had begun to build this abbey um, near Richmond Castle. But far from being pleased, the abbot of Sauvigny was actually quite disappointed and annoyed. He hadn't been consulted, he hadn't been told. And uh, his view was these were kind of poor lands. The experience at Byland um, had, had already kind of demonstrated that this, this was not kind of right pasture land for arable farming and for growing and for generating the kind of revenues they expected from, um, from, from monas monastic lands. So consequently, he was very, very sniffy. And so when he was approached um, to provide um, an abbot and, and monks to, to supply, if you like, to staff up this new monastery, he was rather sniffy. And eventually he decided the answer was no, he wasn't going to supply them. Um, but actually, as it was very nearby Byland, it would fall to Byland Abbey to supply the order with, uh, with the manpower to kind of run it. So he starts off in a very inauspicious sort of circumstances. Um, Peter de Quincio, the kind of the promoter, you have to be very enthusiastic about setting up this new abbey. Look, by the way, at the, the backdrop that we've got over here. Isn't it absolutely glorious? It is a little bit foggy and misty here, but uh, it's not the clearest of days, unfortunately. But uh, we can't choose where they're going to be. Um, let me just get a little drink of water. So, yes, yeah, so monks from Byland were chosen. The problem with the site um, that they'd chosen, though, which it was very exposed to wind, rain, and fog, talking about mist, um, which made it very, very difficult for the community to kind of grow their crops. But arable farming was too high up. Um, and you've got to bear in mind that most of the area around here is given over to sheep farming because it's not good growing. Uh, it looks very lush and green, um, which is fantastic for grazing, but it isn't actually um, particularly good for, excuse me, particularly good for arable farming because often very stony soils um, with very kind of low levels of soil coverage before you're getting down into, uh, into kind of stone again. So consequently, that's a perpetual kind of issue. So they're being given some pretty poor land. Um, and Peter, the monk, was visited um, by the abbot of Quar uh, from the Isle of Wight. Um, and, he, and he sort of made the best case for it. Um, and it's he, he reported that he said he had five ploughs at work, 40 cows with their young, 16 mares with their foals. They had been given by the Earl. They had five sows with their young, 300 sheep and 30 skins in town and waxed and all for two years. But I think this is the quicker, because he then goes on to say they were confident they could find bread, ale, cheese and butter for the first year. So only able to find it for the first year doesn't really suggest that this was a land of plenty. Um, so Peter was very much looking to Sauvigny and to Byland to prop him up and to his earl and basically hoping that, you know, God would grant them some providence, you know, some kind of divine intervention to make this rubbishy land work better for them to sustain this community. But it does really feel that uh, they were on a hiding to nothing and that actually really what they needed to do was move. But in between times, the... Uh, what they call the Sauvignon community, the monastic community from Normandy, was, was sort of folded in with the Cistercians. The Cistercians are a much, much bigger order. And uh, under Bernard of Clairvaux, a um, very, very famous sort of Cistercian leader, um, the, 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 uh, the, the entire Sauvignac order became part of the Cistercian order. So the early Gervo Abbey becomes now part of a, of a, a Cistercian. Uh, monastery. So it, it goes into a kind of different code, a different form of behaviour. It's been from being sort of a Benedictine um, focused abbey to now being a uh, Cistercian. Um, so a chap called John of Kingston, isn't it lovely blue the river by the way? Hope you're all well. Um, 
So a monk called John of Kingston, um, led a colony of monks from Byland Abbey, setting out looking uh, to find the site of Jiva. They'd, they'd never been. Because um, he was going on his way there to teach them the ways of the Cistercian community. So he's their teacher. Um, and he became the first abbot. And the writer of the Byland Chronicle tells us a kind of interesting story. Um, that after Abbot John and his monks had set out from Byland, they spent a night in a, in a village. They couldn't remember the name of the village. Um, but there, Abbot John had a dream or a vision. And he seemed to be in the cloister at Byland. And Abbot Roger, who was the, the abbot of Byland, had directed him to set out with a number of monks for a far-off place, there to receive orders. As he was passing out, he beheld in the middle of the cloister, which is the garden bit in the center of the monastery, a most noble lady, richly clothed, whose beauty excelled all earthly beauty, and who bore on her left arm a beautiful boy, whose face was of the brightness of the moon. So you can probably guess we're talking about Mary and Jesus' vision. So the boy plucked a branch from the tree in the middle of the cloister and then vanished from his sight. The abbot and his companions uh, departed. When they'd gone a little way, they found themselves straightly shut within a place surrounded by thorns and brambles and rocks, and there seemed no escape. In despair, the abbot suggested they should say a prayer. But no sooner had they done so than there appeared a beautiful lady with her boy, so again, Mary and Jesus, about whom Abbot John had seen in the cloister. And the abbot addressed to her, Good lady, he said, I humbly ask thee that thou wilt guide me and my companions wandering in this unknown and straitened place into the way, into that city where the monks, with God's help, ought to be established. This I ask for the love of my friends at Byland, to which house we all belong. The lady replied that they had been of Byland, but they were now of Yorval. When she named Yorval, he greatly marvelled and said, Good lady, show us the way to Yorval, for thither are we bent. She looked at her son and said, Most sweet son, for the love thou hast ever to me, be thou their guide. And the boy, holding out a branch that he plucked at Byland, said, with a bright and joyous countenance, I am going forward. Follow me without fear. At length he reached an uncultivated and forbidding spot, where the boy planted the bough, saying, Here shall God be adored and invoked after a short time. In a moment the bough grew into this beautiful tree, full of white, beautiful birds. The monks were to rest there, for this was the place that they sought. Having planted the bough, the boy Jesus vanished. Abbot John slept no more that night, but rose early in the morning, and he and his monks went on by moonlight. At daybreak they reached the village, and as some of the inhabitants looked out their windows, they saw a number of persons in white pass by. Because these, by the way, were white. They were the white monks, the white brothers. Um, Cistercian monks. So Abbot John, hearing this, hid in the shade by the wall to hear what else might be said. And another man asked his companion, do you know who these are? And the other said no. And then he replied, it was told to me yesterday at the hall that Abbot and 12 monks were migrating from Byland to Jorval. A third man who heard this came out of his house and took observations of the stars and the moon and the signs of the heavens and said, these men are moving at a propitious time. And in a short period of 30 or 40 years, they are in such condition as to suffer from no deficiencies. It's a long time for your luck to strike 30 or 40 years, isn't it? But there you go. That's what they said. So Abbot John was received at Gervo by Acarius, the founder, and uh, many nobles. He appointed Brother Edward, his prior and brother Peter, that we know as the founder, became the cellarer, the wine keeper, the beer keeper. Um, and although throughout this account they talk about Jovo, they're really talking about the original settlement, which is so about 16 miles over there. So how did it come to be focused at this end? Well, they, they did their best. They really kind of did their best. For four years, the abbot of the convent lived up there, but in the fifth year, um, over at Michaelmas, and it was so bad, they basically washed away all 
the harvesting and the seeds perished. So they had to go kind of cap in hand to Byland for help. And Abbot Roger sent them five measures of grain for sowing. Um, but still they were in need. And the land was basically sterile. On account of the weather and the rain conditions, the crops just wouldn't kind of mature. So they kept kind of returning to the mother house. Isn't it pretty? Gil Beck here. Um, but they were kind of prevented from returning really by that very typical kind of human emotion of saying, we don't want you to say, we told you so. Um, these are the monks that said they were going to build, but now they come back sort of cap in hand. Um, so when Abbot Roger comes to visit them, um, he found kind of Abbot John and his convent in kind of dire distress. But they're not able to kind of fully ask for help because of pride, basically. Um, um, and they'd spent more money than they'd received all year just trying to buy corn to replace what was kind of being lost. Um, so again, the Abbot kind of takes pity. He sends them supplies and tries to kind of bail them out. Um, and he also gives them 10 bovates, saying ox gangs, caricates, you remember, such things we've talked about in the past, of land at Ellington, which is about kind of a mile or so in this direction in front of them. Um, and, uh, and so consequently, the um, I'll just try the white thing, but I don't think so. Um, I think it's the, the, the atmosphere in the weather. Um, so the abbot returns off to kind of Richmond. Um, and... Uh, they now sort of call upon Alan, the Earl of Richmond, to get a help them out. I'll just try one more time to get a white, but I think it's more the... Uh, is that maybe a little bit better? Um, to kind of come to their aid. And in the meantime, um, five of the monks have been sent off to uh, Byland, another three to kind of Barrow and Furness, in order to try and kind of uh, minimise, if you like, the amount of people they were going to need to uh, sort of sustain it. Um, so the Earl comes down and he's shown the land um, and he says, leave it with me. You know, I know this is kind of really barren land, um, but I'm, I'll do something about it. But unfortunately, it disappears back to France for two years. Um, but in, eventually, in 1156, they, uh, they come back and uh, they're granted this parcel of land that we're now kind of walking into in, uh, in the village of East Witten here in Wednesday. So that's better good. Um, so we're just going to walk around the corner. So as I do say, the, this picture signal may just drop, come in and out here. We are right in the middle of the countryside, as you can probably tell. Um, if it gets to a stage where it's more out than in, then I will uh, I'll leave the the, um, the stream and and record it in those six two bits together, and we'll do this from at home. But uh, let us uh, let us hope that uh, the variable quality will uh, will be bearable and. Uh, in the spirit of keeping it live, keeping it together, um, we can tolerate a bit of ups and downs because obviously we are, as you can see, in the midst of the, uh, of the Yorkshire Dale. So I'm glad that's helped that bit of a white, but it is, it's not the clearest day. If we'd have hoped for sunshine today, we're to be a bit disappointed. It's rather cooler than, uh, than we might have hoped, but there we are. So we now get the kind of the story, obviously picking up of the second uh, monastery. The monastery that is a Cistercian monastery. So Cistercians by a bit of a prime. We talked about this at Byland. Um, this was an order of monks that had come out of France. Um, sort of medieval, medieval monasticism is kind of in, you know, really uh, influenced by hermits in the kind of Middle East in the kind of 4th and 5th century, sort of St Anthony, people like this, um, who lived very, very um, isolated lives. Um, and as such, they were kind of seen as very, very holy, very, very pure, because um, obviously they're kind of removing themselves from society, from temptation. Um, uh, and a kind of very, very famous influential one is, is of course, um, uh, so the Bernard, the Benedict, sorry, uh, Benedict, um, who is a 6th century Italian monk. And he tries to live a life of sort of seclusion. Um, but actually... He keeps committing these not committing, he keeps um having uh, miracles. You know, they try and poison him twice for some reason. Um and he survives or both on one occasion a raven flies down and takes away his poison bread, which is pretty cool, right? Um so they kind of really look to Benedict as the kind of saviour and the teacher, but he's trying to live this kind of life of isolation. So having lots of followers, you know, think Monty Life of Brian, you know, he won't leave him alone. It's a bit like that situation. So in, in, in the end, he decides to set up 12 monasteries in Italy 
So basically they'll kind of go away and leave him alone, um, but they have to follow rules, you see. It's a rule-based order. And so St. Benedict lays down the rules, and this becomes, if you like, the blueprint for how monasteries are basically set up. So the rule of St. Benedict. But by the sort of 12th century, by the time that this abbey here that we're about to kind of enter into was sort of being built, there was a sense that things were getting pretty lax. The richest and most influential of the abbeys in this area around here, of course, was St. Mary's at York. And St. Mary's was known for being a place of entertainment, a place of kind of hospitality, where there was kind of more focus on fundraising and uh, giving everybody great food, wine, drink, etc. in hospitality than perhaps there was on Christian consecration. Thank you, Elizabeth. So consequently, there was a big move towards a kind of revivalism, if you like. You might have heard of that kind of term, revival, um, whereby a much more austere form of obedience came in. And this is the Cistercians. And they rapidly become the biggest monastic order in Western Europe. And they were on kind of identical lines, uh, the White Friars. Um, they are, the white monks, um, very, very obedient, short around work and kind of labour. Uh, and they've become, eventually, sort of very rich. And what's wonderful about this abbey, to Jervo Abbey, is it a wonderful claim to fame because this is the site where the world famous Wensdale cheese was first produced. So right here, this is the source of Wensdale cheese. Um, so the French monks basically had uh, brought recipes for the soft cheeses they loved to make, to eat, to live off. Um, but in this new land, they were unable to supply a regular supply of cow's milk. So consequently, they adapted the recipes for ewe's milk, for sheep's milk. And in, in doing so, they kind of create this entirely new taste and texture. So this is actually how, um, Alan, this, is, this is how it comes into being when it's sort of a mistake really of not being able to really source the ingredients they wanted. So that all starts here at Jervo. Um, and with the kind of generous bequest of lands, the Abbey soon becomes kind of really well established. It was also known for horse breeding, very famously attached to horse breeding. Um, and that, that uh, tradition has continued onwards. Midlam, which is that we were obviously at Midlam, weren't we, a couple of weeks back, that's about four miles from here, major horse breeding and training centre. So that sort of continued onwards to this day. And in 1268, I'll show you the park, and we're going to have a walk in the park, and I've been around the Abbey. And in 1268, the Duke of Brittany, an Earl of Richmond, one and the same, still this kind of linking of power between England and France, you understand, um, was uh, confirmed, you know, gave, if you like, their charter, confirmed the grants of lands, their income, their earnings, a lot of Winsdale cheese going on in the chat, I can see that. Um, that this abbey that had been built in the honour of the Blessed Mary, because you remember it was Mary and the baby Jesus that guided them to their first spot at Yervo. So they get the charge in 1281. And uh, there's not many more events telling you about this place because it's not very recorded, but there's one really interesting one. Um, and that is in 1279, the Cistercian annuals uh, of the abbey record the murder of Philip Abbott of Jervis, the abbot was murdered by one of his own monks. His successor, Abbot Thomas, was accused of complicity, but uh, the murder actually was committed by William de Moditha, who was one of the other monks, and uh, he absolutely fled. Um, I'll just show you this over here, actually. Um, and had been outlawed. So you kind of think, wouldn't you, in this kind of strict religious community, that uh, you know, violence against your fellow man, let alone murder, would be surprisingly rare if not extinct but it just shows living cheek by gel those human traits can no doubt overtake so let me just show you this this is the water source so from the river Ure, and of course what's happened is the monks have diverted the water source so they've got fresh water coming into the monastery you can't have a community of course without fresh water so uh, this is an example of monastic engineering and kind of drainage um so what we do know is that for the most part um this abbey would have been free of sort of oversight. Um, as a Cistercian house, it didn't have um, archbishop's visitation, Ar Archie, archiepiscopal, is that what they call it? Um, so consequently, there's very few entries in the register. It's only the bad things that happen. Um, they're running out of money, having to borrow money, and murders of abbots. So day-to-day -day life is lost. But the beauty 
of the cessation order was, is all kind of the same practices and procedures. Um, so what I thought would be kind of good would be to, as we're going to walk around and have a look at the, the ruins we're on Easter Sunday, is to tell you about how they celebrate Easter in the monasteries. Does that sound like a, a good idea? I, <laughs> I mean, you have to say yes, because I've prepared the tour, the base you could say yes. So I asked the question in my head, you all said, yeah, that's a great idea, John. Do that. So uh, if that's not the answer you think you're right, I hope that it will be, uh, hope it will be of interest and timely and uh, relevant at least, and uh, a momentary discussion. So hi everybody, I'm just going to um, pause it there just to make sure that you can um, hear me because I am just moving across now into uh, the pre-recorded session. So um, just give me a little bit of a... I saw Janie's comments there about the, the murder in the Abbey. Absolutely. It's uh, shocking, isn't it, what monks will do. So you let me know that you can just hear me okay before I just hit play again on the video. Um, and if so, and I know we're all kind of synchronised, then uh, we'll go ahead. So I'm just waiting just for somebody just let me know that you can hear me. Uh, here, okay, done. Perfect. Okay. Audio is still good. Fantastic. Okay. So, right, we're about to move now into the the stuff that basically, um, you know, obviously I came back and we can record it again. So, obviously, we, we've walked from the cover banks, from the river banks, obviously talks about the history and the settlement at the Abbey, the original version, obviously relocating into this precise location. And you can see now, it's still quite a way, um, we've kind of walked through Parkland, but of course, the Parklands, and we'll, we'll scan out across it in a minute, would have been um, the area that was there to support the Abbey, um, insofar as... Um, you need to get a farmland and so forth. So we'll talk about that as we go on. So hopefully everything is good. Um, do let me know uh, if there's any issue. By the way, do you notice on the gate, by the way, we have the El Camino shells. So again, we have the, 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 the shells suggesting pilgrimage. So the first thing to show you here is before we start talking about Easter is this really remarkable survivor from the medieval period. This is an embalming slab. It was a stone slab that would have been used to first wash and then embalm the bodies of monks obviously dead monks, prior to burial. Originally it would have been the monks in Fur, which isn't, isn't too far away from here. Um, and it's worth noting actually that people in rich communities were especially susceptible to contagious diseases because of course they were in close confinement. It's known that the Black Death that ran through Europe in the middle of the 14th century was especially deadly for monastic uh, communities. Um, and monasteries of course often hosted visitors including Bogotá, so if you look at the map, uh, and I'll come back to this in a second. So you're looking, obviously, most of these walls aren't here anymore, or rather you can see the grey is and the, the coloured bits aren't. So it kind of shows you, um, that, you know, what's there and what's kind of not there. And we're obviously going to explore all these kind of places on the tour. So the embalming slabs are pretty rare. I, I've never seen one, uh, Leslie, in, in situ in a monastery. That's not to say that the, they don't exist, but... Um, I think it seems pretty kind of rare. So you can sort of see the various elements of here. You see the meat kitchen there, the infirmary, the abbey. So we're going to go walk around the whole kind of thing. Um, but of course, monasteries host of visitors, including pilgrims and travellers. And these interactions increase the chance of plague entering the community. Monks living in close kind of contact with another within these communities. As a result, the disease spread rapidly um, amongst them. Um, and they also served as hospitals during the outbreak in the infirmary for the lay brothers and for others. So consequently, if you're caring for the afflicted, um, this kind of noble service exposed them to infection and whole monasteries were wiped out by the plague. The death toll was so kind of rapid in some monastic communities, they ceased to exist entirely. And then of course, the loss of priests further made it more difficult to strain monastic life, disrupt religious services, because the surviving monks would face immense challenges in maintaining their kind of daily routines and spiritual practice. But many, including Jervo, found a form of rebirth possible, albeit with much kind of reduced wealth. So we're just kind of panning out now, obviously, across um, the parkland, um, and you get a sense of this kind of surrounding land that's around. And of course, this was incredibly important monasteries survived on what they grew on livestock on the rearing of animals of kind of animal products of course being to sell butter cheese milk 
um, honey, beer, wine, you name it, they're, they're kind of producing entities. So consequently, they needed an awful lot of land around them. So that's why they had to really move, because the land originally they were given, probably with the best intentions, was very poor quality land. So let's talk about Easter then. Um, as I say, we filmed this originally Easter, Easter Sunday. So for Christians, obviously, Easter is about ce celebrating the kind of central miracle of Jesus' death and resurrection. And it's been a very important day in the religious calendar since the very earliest days of Christianity. In medieval England, churches held intricate rituals and dramatic religious ceremonies, and clergy and congregations all took part in kind of various processions, vigils, and plays over the Easter weekend, which of course was last weekend. Now the Puritans banned Easter, uh, celebrating 1647, they thought it was all very high Catholic, and although it was restored after 1660, it never quite regained its former glory in the English church. So what I'm talking about here, really here is maybe some high Anglican would follow this now, but this is more relating to the kind of medieval Catholic Christianity than perhaps um, the, the sort of Christian worship and services would encounter now, but of course, being uh, in a monastery, Cistercian monastery, all about obedience, this would be absolutely kind of the way through. So Easter then, the commemoration of Christ's resurrection after his death on the cross, is probably the holiest day in the Christian year. And given Easter's importance to Christians, it's no surprise that medieval monasteries observed this most sacred of days with elaborate church services and ceremonies. So a bit of a kind of primer, obviously, um, before Easter we get Lent. So Lent is a six-week period before Easter, and it's characterised by fasting and penance. It represents the mournful atonement for sin. And it echoes and commemorates the 40 days that Christ spent in the desert, being tempted by Satan, before embarking upon his ministry at the age of 30. So the ultimate sources for observances, services and ceremonies of Lent the Holy Week and Easter are, of course, in the Christian Gospels. They tell us that in the medieval period, as now, Lent began on Ash Wednesday, a day of utmost solemnity. So before, of course, we have Ash Wednesday, we have Shrove Tuesday. We'll come back to that again, called Pancake Day. We'll come back to that in a minute. So Ash Wednesday is a day of utmost solemnity. Ash Wednesday is so called because at the Mass, the Eucharist, or Holy Communion, a priest anointed the foreheads of the faithful with ashes. So I've got a couple of images just uh, jumping in here for you of priests being anointed with a cross, the ashes, maybe you anointed the wrong word, um, on Ash Wednesday, this kind of solemn day about to go into Lent. And these ashes would have been um, kind of readily understood by the medieval Christians as symbolising penance and grief and were a kind of reminder of mortality. So the ceremonies accompanying the distribution of ashes at medieval monasteries are described as customaries, books describing the customs and ceremonies of a monastery. So we therefore know that a Cistercian abbey such as Jervo, the abbot would bless the ashes with holy water. And the barefoot monks would then take turns to kneel before him as he smeared ashes on the foreheads, while saying in Latin the words, remember, O man, that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So the Lenten fast begins on Ash Wednesday. For monks and nuns, this entailed a period of total prohibition of meat and fats of all sorts, including eggs, butter and cheese. Fish, however, was permitted on Sundays and some holy days. So the austerities of Lent extend to the kind of visual appearance also of monastic churches. The sculptured images of saints adorning their walls and altars were covered by cloths and a Lenten veil, which is a kind of large cloth used to obscure the high altar from view. Now we know from uh, reports of the, from, from Lindisfarne Priory in 1533 that it is recorded um, that the, 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 the Lenten veil is a black material, which is a kind of colour reflective of the season's general spirit of mournfulness. Now actually we tend to associate it with kind of rebirth and green and spring, but of course set in the context of you know, the death of Christ, black, darkness, austerity, you can see how that kind of fits in. So the first kind of next, you know, important date then, we have is Palm Sunday. This is marked on the fifth and the final Sunday of Lent, and the start of Holy Week. So Palm Sunday was marked by some of those elaborate ceremonies of the religious year. 
The day commemorates Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, which is almost unique, uniquely described in all four Gospels. And those in particular of Matthew and Mark tell how Christ's um, disciples and followers spread palms cut from trees before him as he rode into the city on the back of a donkey. So we've got a medieval image here of, uh, of palms. So you can see the donkeys laid down the palms, the adoration, and obviously the disciples by now saints, which of course they wouldn't have been at the time, and particularly the kind of halos sort of following in. So um, everything, so sort of hagiography, as you might say, the sort of study and worship of saints is on show here. Um, but this, of course, is the kind of classical imagery um, of kind of Palm Sunday. So within the, the, the monasteries, it will be dramatically kind of reenacted um, on the morning of Palm Sunday. Branches of trees in early spring, so maybe the princess of these trees, um, in, in early kind of spring leaf or evergreens, such as box or yew, would used to be represent the palm fronds. You're not going to get a lot of fronds, palm fronds in North Yorkshire, so consequently you have to make do. So um, yew trees uh, in particular in use to kind of recreate what's being described in the Gospels. And after they've been kind of blessed by the abbot of the priory or the officiating priest in nunnery um, near the altar of the monastic church, these palm fronds and representatives would be distributed to the assembled community. And the community would process around the clo cloister, halting on three occasions to make stations, at each of which they chanted special prayers and hymns suitable for the day. So the last of these stations was made just before the entrance to the church which in medieval ages would have been allegorised as heavenly Jerusalem. So here two of the brothers, in emulation of the children of Jerusalem, welcoming Christ as he approached the gates of the holy city, sang the hymn Gloria, Lausus Honour, All Glory, Lord and Honour. And a translation of this hymn is still sung to, these, to this day in kind of processions on Palm Sunday. Um, so next we have Maundy Thursday. So the observances intensified on Wednesday of Holy Week, when the veil that obscured the high altar throughout Lent was removed. In the dark early morning hours of Maundy Thursday, the service of Tenebrae, the service of the shadows, was sung. So again, let me bring up an image of Tenebrae for you. So the Tenebrae hearse, as it's known, is a triangular frame supporting up to 24 candles, representing the prophets and the apostles. So this will be set up in the church, and the candles were gradually extinguished as the service progressed. So of course it would be fairly dark in the first place, so imagine that each um, extinguisher gets darker, until eventually there's only one single candle, and this represents the light of Christ that was left burning. So this service was repeated early on the mornings of Good Friday and Holy Saturday. And by the late Middle Ages, it had become the, uh, the custom for this service to be anticipated and celebrated in darkness of the night before. So Maundy Thursday takes his name from the description of the Last Supper in the Gospel of St John. And it tells how Christ, after washing the feet of his disciples, gave them the commandment or mandate, mandatum in Latin, mande in French, hence mondi in English, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. So to emulate this command, two ceremonial washings of feet took place at monasteries on Maundy Thursday. So the first took place early in the afternoon. As many poor men as there were monks in the monastery were brought into the cloister, where their feet were ritually washed and then kissed by the monks. Afterwards, each pauper was given a coin in charity and provided with a free meal in the monastic guest house. And of course, Maundy money, we still do in this country, the monarch, so Prince Charles, King Charles rather, gave his first Maundy money to me this year. Um, so the second foot washing was held in the early evening. The monastic community led by their abbots gathered in the refectory, which is their kind of communal dining hall, to emulate Christ joining with the apostles for the last supper. Because bear in mind, Good Friday is going to be the following day. Okay, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. So the community then moved to the adjoining cloister alley, which comes to the cloister, uh, as you're looking at now, so the kind of square area, um, where the lavabo 
the washing basins were located for the daily washing of hands before entering the refectory. So here the monastic superior, in imitation of Christ, would wash, dry and kiss the feet uh, of his twelve of his brethren, who we intend to represent the apostles. Now Bede, the famous medieval author, teacher and scholar, recalls Maundy Thursday ceremony occurring as early as before the year 700 on the island monastery of Lindisfarne. So finally, they're lovely the flowers. I really want to kind of keep going close and show you the flowers. And hopefully the picture nice and clear as well. Then. So finally, we come to Good Friday, arguably the most solemn day in the Christian year, and certainly the most solemn day in the monastery. So Good Friday commemorates the final day of Christ's life on earth. His arrest, trial, mocking, crucifixion, and death on the cross. It's the only day of the year on which Mass is not celebrated. The principal service at medieval monasteries and many parish churches was to set a ceremony known as the Adoration of the Holy Cross. So the crucifix, which usually stood on the high altar, was removed and placed on a step at the front. And each member of the monastic community would then approach the crucifix, and at some monasteries they'd do it on the knees, which gave the service its internal alternative name, rather, called Creeping to the Cross. Have you heard of that, Reverend Doc? Creeping to the Cross? Um, the community would then prostrate themselves before the cross and kiss it. At some monasteries, the crucifix includes a relic of the true cross. Now, when I say this, obviously, we're talking about an era, so I should bring this up. Um, on the left-hand side, you've got a cross from Durham, on the right one from Vienna, that were believed to, 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 to contain fragments of the crew, true cross. The medieval era was absolutely awash with um, the, uh, the, the, the symbols, if you like, of um, uh, relics, rather, of, 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 of the early church. Um, to what degree it's true, it will never know. Um, people have believed it. So, but of course, it meant that it re upped the ante in terms of the importance of these locations. So, to come and pray on Good Friday in a monastery with a fragment of the Holy Cross meant that you were kind of pretty much kind of plugged into the mains in terms of your kind of spiritual connectivity and so forth. So, you can understand why this was kind of really valid. So, it's to say the left hand side one is Durham, uh, the right hand side one that you're looking at right now is from Vienna. So people very much believed uh, in the power of relics, of praying to bones of saints, part of the cross, nails from the crucifixion. Um, obviously, the Turin Shroud is the most kind of famous one that still survives. Is it? Is it a fake? Is it? A, is it genuine? We'll, kind of, we'll never probably never get to an answer, and we probably shouldn't because this is based on faith rather than facts. Um, but nonetheless, um, that's what you're kind of looking at. So the monks on Good Friday would be kneeling and, and kind of really making themselves humble in front of the crosses. Um, So after the completion of the service of the Adoration, the burial of Christ was then reenacted using a temporary structure called the Easter Sepulchre. And this was intended to represent the Holy Sepulchre, or Tomb, of Christ. It was usually made of poles and cloth. And the Easter Sepulchre, uh, Sepulchre we haven't really got any images apart from one, and it's a bit faded, but nonetheless, um, it's as good as we kind of get. And it's from a painting of the Church of St. Mary in Kempley in England. Um, it's rather faded, but let me again just bring it up for you, and we just try and kind of look. So what you can hopefully kind of see is the kind of the raised up fabric, the folds of the fabric, and um, the members of the clergy. And basically, what they kind of created was um, uh, the, the sort of trying to create the tomb, you know, the cave. So they were usually positioned on an existing structure, such as you know either a tomb. Because often the, the, the former abbots, you know, were buried by by the by the altar uh, in monasteries. Um, so it's usually to the north of the high altar, and the kind of the reenactment of Christ's burial typically involved placing a crucifix, sometimes according to a blessed communion wafer, within the sepulchre. So in effect, it's like a sort of tent on the altar. Candles are lit before the structure, and occasionally monks, in imitation of the Roman soldiers sent to guard Christ's tomb, would keep vigil by its side. So Holy Saturday witnessed the kindling of Paschal, or Easter, the Easter candle. And this was done using burning coals after every other... I'll go back to the, uh, to the video. Um, after every other 
uh, of the candle and lamp in the church had been extinguished. So these were placed uh, close to the high altar, and the candle was made of the finest wax and would quite to weigh at least three pounds. So affixed to the candle was a card inscribed with the year since the birth of Christ, together with various numerals and letters used to calculate the date of this movable feast, such as Easter. So calculating the date when Easter would have been agreed, uh, celebrated, was agreed at the Synod of Whitby in 664. In the 7th century Britain, there were several differences between Roman and Celtic Christianity, and one of these was the method used for calculating the date of Easter. The Celtic practice was that of Gaelic monks associated with the island of Iona, where monks observed an 84-year Easter cycle, as had been the rule in Gaul and in Rome. Whereas the new tradition, which was kept in Rome by this time, was a 19-year cycle, which had been adopted from the church at Alexandria. So in the kingdom of Northumbria, which is where Lindisfarne was and Whitby was, these two traditions coexisted, and each had been kind of encouraged by different royal houses. So the Synod of Whitby was convened to settle a controversy about the correct method of calculating the date of Easter. So early Christians were probably originally celebrated concurrent with the Jewish Passover, which was held on the 14th day of the first lunar month of the Jewish year, called Nisan. And this was the day of crucifixion, according to John chapter 19, verse 14. However, the first council of Nicaea, under Constantine in 325, decreed that Christians should no longer use the Jewish calendar, but should universally celebrate Easter on a Sunday, the day of the resurrection, as had come to the custom in Rome and Alexandria. So calculating a proper date, a process known as computers, so where computer comes from, computers, working on Easter, was a complex process involving a loony solar calendar, in other words, measuring the movements of the, of the, of the moon and the sun, or rather the earth around the sun, rather. And different kind of calculation tab tables developed, which resulted in different dates for, of course, the celebration of Easter. So, kind of complicated, but nonetheless, I think we can all now agree what Easter Sunday is, at least the one that we kind of mark. So, on Easter Sunday, then, in the early hours of Easter Sunday, the resurrection of Christ was reenacted by the removal of the crucifix from the Easter sepulchre, where it rested since the afternoon of Good Friday. The crucifix was carried in triumph to the high altar, and then joyful procession around the monastic church. The altars would have been washed and strewn with fresh herbs in preparation for this holiest of days, and the hymn Christ is Risen was sung. High Mass was celebrated. The officiating clergy were in the monastery's best vestments, which had been made of velvet sink with elaborate embroideries of gold and silver thread. And for the next three days, monks and nuns were excused manual labour, using the time instead to read devotional books in the cloister. So restrictions on the diet, which had been in place since Ash Wednesday, were also relaxed. And so this is also a reason behind so many of our secular customs associated with Easter. And that's partly because Easter follows Lent, a period of religious observance and abstinence from worldly pleasures to remember Jesus fasting in the desert. Now, to many people, the day they might give up chocolate. But before Reformation, Lent was rather more involved for English Christians. You were supposed to avoid eating meat, eggs or diary. Dairy, sorry. They couldn't play sport, and they had to abstain from sex. So when Easter came around, there were many good reasons to celebrate. Now, the 14th century uh, Shropshire cleric John Merck wrote of Easter as the time when fires were extinguished, hearth strewn with fresh rushes, flowers displayed, and houses cleaned. The spring clean, right? Celebrations went on for many days after the Easter weekend. So even if the Reformation reduced the number of holy days on which people weren't expected to work, the 17th century poet Nicholas Breton still thought of it as the sun's dancing day and the earth's holy day, a time for nothing but play and mirth. Even by the mid-19th century, when holidays were few and far between for working people, Good Friday was still one of two national days off, the other being Christmas Day. So let's look at some of our kind of increasingly secular traditions of Easter. So hot cross buns. So today, sweet, plump, hot cross buns can be supplied on the supermarket shelves as early as January. But traditionally, they were a treat to be tucked into on Good Friday. Um, so let's bring up a 
an image of Hot Cross Brothers, who we all know what they're like, but just in case anybody is a, he's unfamiliar. Um, look at the image on the left, I'll tell you about the right one in a minute. So the early mention of a Hot Cross Bun, the earliest mention we've got, can be found in Poor Robin's Almanac for 1733. And it says, Good Friday comes this month, the old woman runs with one or two a penny Hot Cross Buns. So the buns now around, but they weren't necessarily going back in history. In fact, some 19th century sources describe them as triangular cakes. And the cross on the top was kind of nothing special, with many breads being marked with the cross right into the 20th century. So in other words, now the inlay that we've put on um, isn't necessarily historical. What was remarkable about the buns was they were baked on Good Friday, which imbued them with various magical properties. So many people believe that bread or buns baked on Good Friday would never go mouldy, or they could be used to treat a range of medical complaints. So good Friday bread would be hung for a string from the kitchen ceiling, and pieces broken off and soaked as and when needed throughout the year. Now they could also bring good luck. A 1753 work record, a witness to a murder, saying that if we do eat a piece of cake made purposely on Good Friday, we shall never want money or victuals all the year round which for as many years as I can remember has always fallen out true. So nearly a century later in 1841, the writer and folklorist William Hone noted in the Saturday magazine that in the houses of some ignorant people, a Good Friday bun is still kept for luck. So by now, in the ignorant people. And sometimes there hangs from the ceiling a hard biscuit-like cake of open cross work, baked on Good Friday to remain there till displaced on the next Good Friday by one of a single, similar make. In other words, it stay there all year round. So every year, look at the right hand picture now, we're going to talk about the, the widow's bun, a naval tradition. Um, so the widow's son is a pub in the London borough of Bromley, so down in, in Leslie Ram's uh, neck of the woods, so Bromley in South East London, in Kent, um, has kind of upheld this Good Friday tradition of storing hot cross buns in a net over the bar since 1858. The legend goes kind of something like this. The pub was built on the site of an old cottage belonging to a widow whose only son left to go to sea during the Napoleonic Wars. He wrote to her explaining that he'd be returning home at Easter and have a nice hot cross bun waiting for him. He never returned, but his grieving mother continues to keep a fresh hot cross bun every Good Friday for the rest of her life. And after a life, a huge collection of hot cross buns was discovered in a net hanging from the ceiling of a cottage. So this cottage becomes the pub. The pub was built in 1858 on the site of the cottage and they've carried on the tradition uh, ever since with a sailor adding a bun to the net hanging over a ceiling every Good Friday. So I've offended Leslie, I do apologise. Um, I think it's your neck of the woods. Um, rather than your homeland. Um, so let's go back to our, our kind of video. So that's hot cross buns for you. Um, originally, cook them on Good Friday to imbue them, of course, with, in effect, everything that was special about Easter. So, um, sports and games. Very big over Easter. So all kinds of kind of sports and games took place on Easter Monday into the following week, including archery contests, hunting, handball games, horse racing and dancing. The Leicester Hare Hunt took place on Easter Monday until about 1767, um, by which time the hair had been replaced by a dead cat, suiting an to let Leone, suiting aniseed water to provide a trail for the hounds. The Epping Forest Stag Hunt was a favourite of the early 19th century EastEnders, who travelled up to the woods to track down an elderly stag released from a cart, um, although the event became so popular it was banned in 1847. In some parts of the country, Good Friday, we see people heading to open space, take part in communal skipping. Is being aware of communal skipping? Uh, it kind of largely died out during the Second World War, people were told to be more sensible. But communal skipping was a thing at Easter. So some Easter traditions sort of still survive. Um, and again, you know, typical kind of English, um, what you describe, I suppose, as, as eccentricity. So this is a picture here of uppies and downies. It's a mass football game in Workington, in Cumberland, on the edge of the Lake District, um, which has been played over the Easter weekend since at least 1769. Very, very hard to kind of pick out the rules. Um, basically, uh, the players try and carry a leather ball between the village and the harbour, about kind of a mile and a half. And it's a thoroughly violent affair, very good-natured, um, but far more so in the past. And we had players 
records of players drowning in 1882 and 1932, and there have been several very serious injuries. Does this put out put off the young man for doing it every year, getting tanked up and doing it? Of course not, because that's tradition, right? So consequently, um, we have uh, that. So in Leicestershire, uh, the village of Leicestershire of Hallerton, um, they've got their own version. This one's called bottle kicking. Um, and it's an annual scramble for pieces of pie, followed by bottle kicking, which is again another mass football game, this time played between two villages on Easter Monday. There's your bottles, and the bottles are again kind of small wooden cakes. They're blessed in the church in the morning before being wrestled over for much of the rest of the day. Uh, and this scramble dates back to at least 1796, and the football game probably developed from it in sort of subsequent years. So, again, just a delightful... Um, what what we've got eccentricity, you know, you got you gotta got love it. So um a tradition that isn't so much now um done is Easter cards. The Victorians were very, very keen on Easter cards. That they, they really kind of went in for Easter cards. Um but it is much, much less of a kind of thing, uh, I think kind of these days. Um insofar as they invented greeting cards after the introduction of half police stamp in the eighteen seventies. And they could kind of send them as often as they wanted through the year. Um, the thing about the Easter cards, I'm going to bring some up for you here. And this will sort of go, hopefully, on a uh, a bit of a... Uh, hopefully, you, you're wrong. Is um, the Easter cards were kind of bizarre, really. Insofar as they were sort of fantastical, could be downright odd. Um, the strangest of them even kind of got like a kind of spring sense of kind of new life and hope, kind of brighter days to come. But everything with the chicks... The bunnies, all these kind of things, you know, rabbits, they're, they're all kind of in evidence. So in case you could have wondered, um, is this kind of link? So many of these kind of motifs of birth, chicks, eggs, bunnies, all kind of present and correct. But of course the Easter egg is by far the most sort of common surviving way we celebrate Easter Day. So you see the child, they're breaking out the egg. And millions of eggs are sold in 2019, the most recent figures I could get. We bought a whopping £206 million worth of them. In this country, um, they first went on sale in 1873, but their origins are in much older traditions. So, so throughout pe history, people across the world have given each other eggs at spring festivals to mark the seasons. Early Christians in Mesopotamia dyed eggs in the period after Easter, and the practice was adopted by Orthodox churches. And from there, it kind of spread into Western Europe. And eggs, of course, represent new life and rebirth. And it's thought this ancient custom was absorbed into Easter celebrations. So in medieval times, eggs couldn't be eaten during the feast, fast of Lent. So the fast ended on Easter Sunday, and egg giving and eating was an important part of the celebrations. And this is especially true for the poor, for whom meat was expensive and eggs were a more affordable luxury. But royals got in, royals got in the act too as well. And so the early specific record of an Easter egg in England comes in 1290, when Edward I purchased 450 eggs. They're decorated with colours and gold leaf and given to members of his household. In the 16th century, before England's break with Rome, the Pope sent Henry VIII an egg in a silver case as an Easter gift. So various traditions and superstitions sprang up around the egg at, uh, at Easter. Let's go back to our figure, shall we? That's the last couple of minutes. And... Uh, Have we run out of video? Oh, well, we'll go back to me then. Well, have a look at me. You can, you can see me instead. Um, so, hopefully, that will look on. So, various kind of traditions and superstitions sprang around the egg at Easter. So, eggs were laid on the on Good Friday, were said to turn into diamonds if they were kept for 100 years. And some thought that eggs cooked on Good Friday and eaten on Easter would promote fertility and prevent sudden death. Um, and it became the custom to have your eggs blessed before you ate them. It was also said that if your egg had two yolks, you'd soon become rich. In Devon and Cornwall, we used to play a game like conquers with their eggs, hitting them against each other until one of them cracked. Um, and as at Easter and other seasonal festivals, it was common for poorer people to be given food and go from door to door to ask for it. So evidence for the tradition can be found in children's chants, like this one collecting the Wirral in the 19th century. And it is, please Mrs Whiteleg, please give us an Easter egg. If you won't give us an Easter egg, your hens will all lay coddled eggs and your cocks all lay stones. So in North West England, this tradition developed into pace egging. 
The youngster would dress up and provide entertainment in exchange for food, money and beer. So paste eggs can still be found in Lancashire and West Yorkshire, one of those famous being a Hepton store, a place we're going to visit later on this year. The word paste comes from Paschal, the Latin name for Easter, as well as paste egging, and can be found in the northern tradition of making paste eggs. So eggs were hard boiled with onion skins or gorse flowers to give them colourful shells. And the custom derived from the older elite tradition of decorating eggs. But it was only by the 18th century that everyday folk could afford to use eggs for fun rather than food. So they grew in popularity in the 1700s in towns, cities and villages across the north of England and Scotland. They were used as decorations and given as presents. And egg rolling was popular too, especially in Yorkshire, Lancashire and Cumbria. And events still take place at Preston and Ulverston. Now in 1867, the Lancashire Post reported Preston's egg rolling events. So I'll just bring up, uh, if I've got uh, here, the, the egg rolling picture, the kind of last thing of our images. Um, you see quite how many there is in the park. So it's described in the newspapers as thousands of eggs were rolled in every direction. Children were everywhere laughing and capering in infantile pleasure. The elders were looking on with a more stead and demure, but not less hearty enjoyment. And altogether the scene was one of the strangest and yet most thoroughly happy and enjoyable I've seen for years. So the aim of course was for children to compete to see who could roll their egg the furthest without it breaking. It was also a tradition to destroy any remaining shells. Otherwise, Lancashire witches would steal them and use them to make boats. I love that. Um, so lastly, egg hunts. So the custom of the Easter egg hunt has been a feature of e English Easters since the late 19th century. It has its uh, origins in, in Germany, where according to, uh, to, to at least to one tradition, um, they were invented by Martin Luther to give congregations a lesson about the discovery of the empty tomb. And it's also said that, uh, that Cabri um, used this uh, for the original Easter egg. It was hollow in the inside. Before everything put sweets on the inside, it was hollow. And the idea was you crack it open and it's Christ's empty tomb. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But that, that it said that. Um, so the first reference to an egg hunt um, can be found in George Frank von Frankenhell's 1682 essay, um, which is called About Easter Eggs, um, De Uvis Pachelbusch. Um, so according to George, a hare brought the eggs for the children to find. So this seems to be the origin or the earliest reference to the Easter Bunny. The Hanoverans, who came over obviously and took over the, the, the crown in this country, um, brought Easter egg hunts to England. And Queen Victoria enjoyed egg hunts as a child. On Easter Sunday, 1833, she wrote, Mama did some pretty painted and ornamental eggs, and we looked for them. So Victoria continued this German tradition with Prince Albert, who had, hid the eggs in little moss baskets for the children to find. So Victoria made numerous references to these egg hunts in her journals, including in 1848, when the royal family was at Osborne on the Isle of Wight, and she wrote, During our breakfast and after, the children hunted for Easter eggs, it being Maundy Thursday, and they were in the greatest delight. They obviously enjoyed it. However, unlike the kind of German Christmas tree which Victoria and Albert did popularise in England, egg hunts remained a novelty here until the end of the century. And even in 1892, um, the poet A.E. Houseman thought it worth noting that in Germany at Easter time they hide coloured eggs about the house and garden that children may amuse themselves in discovering them. But a year later, uh, the Cumbrian newspaper, the Witten Advertiser, noted that in the village of Aitken, on Easter Monday afternoon, an Easter egg hunt was then enjoyed in the rectory garden where eggs were discovered of colours in places that would have astonished the hens that laid them. So this is the earliest reference to an English Easter egg hunt and it's found on the, online on the British newspaper archives. But it seems unlikely this small Lake District village was the first in the country to hold such a hunt. The tradition was certainly more kind of widespread in the early 1900s. In 1902, Hamleys, the toy shop, advertised an Easter egg hunt box in the Gentleman magazine, calling it a novelty for children's parties given at Eastertide. The box contained eggs and a hare, which are all hidden in suitable places, and the children are sent to hunt for them. Three of the eggs contain coupons, first, second and third prizes, and the others are filled with little trinket, trinkets and toys. So in the same year, another newspaper, The Queen, noted that many of the leading confections in London or the provinces keep these boxes. 
and the further records of local hunts throughout the country in the 1900s and a syndicated columnist in 1907 was satisfied that small Britons, like small Germans, take very kindly to the exciting pastime. In 1908, an article in the Queen uh, publication gave ideas for hosting a properly arranged Easter egg hunt for adults, featuring riddles about trees and flowers, but it also conceded that for a party of children it's quite amusing enough to hide them lavishly and then to just set the children loose. So I do hope that you've enjoyed um, uh, what we've kind of talked about tonight in covering the Easter traditions, both in terms of the religious, the spiritual, but also the secular, and also the kind of the, the crossover, the link between the two. Um, some I'm sure have been familiar to you, perhaps some were new. Um, and kind of along with Christmas, I think Easter sits happily as both a kind of religious and a secular festival. And it's got a wonderful kind of indistinguishable link with nature being situated in the calendar at a time when we're seeing nature back in full swing after winter. After winter. So whether by heavenly ordination or coincidence, um, we cannot fail but to see the re re relevance of rebirth. And it's my favourite holiday of the year. I don't know about, about you. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed it here in Wednesday, uh, amongst the landscape and the ruins of Gervais. Of course, this place was chosen for us, if we believe the story of Abbot John. Um, it's chosen, of course, we were led there by Mary and the baby Jesus. So what better place for us to visit it on Easter Sunday. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining Thank you all for your support. Um, by the way, if you supported last time, don't don't imagine that I expect a second uh, contribution. Um, but thank you everybody um, that has kind of supported it and supports me and, and supports, of course, Together Virtually. So um, that's my kind of Easter gig. Tomorrow we'll be in York. I'll be looking at the Snooks. And uh, for those that don't know, the Snooks are, uh, are all reading books. So we're going to also delve into the world of reading, the history of reading. When did that start? How did it come about? And, uh, and some thoughts on reading. So I've really enjoyed my time with you. I'm going to go and have my uh, dinner now because time is getting on. We're a shade over our hour together. And uh, as ever, it's been a genuine pleasure. And so thank you, everybody. And um, please give this video a like. Please give me a follow if you aren't already. And um, I look forward to seeing many of you uh, tomorrow. Um, and do remind yourself to give me a follow, subscribe, and do all the lovely things um, that you can all do. And I will see you all very soon. Thank you from my home in York.